I've always heard that most of us only use 40 to 50% of our brain power. I'm not sure if this is true. I think for the most part, we just wander through our lives on autopilot until something snaps us into gear, and then we process the information with almost stunning efficiency. Let's look at my situation in particular. I had a day off and I decided to do something nice for my wife, Natalie. I decided to surprise her at work with flowers and invite her out to lunch. Nat and I work at the same law firm. I am a legal assistant and she is a secretary. When I arrived at the office, I did not see her at her workplace, but I heard voices from the office. In order not to disturb if there was a meeting with a client, I quietly opened the door, as I had done many times. However, what I saw came as a shock to me. Nat was in a compromising situation with our boss, Gunnar Sterling. At first I was speechless with surprise, but then I was overcome with anger. I opened the door and entered. Nat tried to explain herself, saying that it didn't mean anything and she was just curious, but I was too upset. Ganner, I quit, I said. As I slammed the door behind me and ran out of the office, it was all I could do not to cry. I made it to the parking lot and got into my car before my emotions got the better of me, and I let the tears roll down my cheeks as my body shook with sobs. As I cried, I wondered how Nat could do this to me. We've been together for so long and made so many sacrifices just to be together. Our wedding itself was a dangerous and heartbreaking event, as each of our families subsequently largely disowned us. My family and I were always close, and I think I was probably my father's favorite. I grew up in a middle-class area in a pretty good family. I met Natalie in high school, and we became friends immediately. There were originally three of us, but the third member of the trio, Melanie Wright, started dating and didn't have much time for us. It was a blow because back then we always hung out at Mel's house. Her parents were exactly what I wanted my parents to be. Her father and I were especially close. He often gave me advice on how to handle certain situations I found myself in with teachers or peers. When school ended, Melanie was already in love with Bobby Bradley. They attended the same college and got married soon after. In the four years between childhood and adulthood, I had not made a single connection, and I wondered why. I was very popular and was asked out many times, but I never accepted. I even turned down some of the cheerleaders. They just seemed too prim to me. Besides, there was no one at that school I was with anyway. Preferred would like to spend time more than with Nat. Our college experience was even less dramatic. Everyone was so busy experimenting, finding our own path to adulthood and becoming a productive member of society that no one really cared about us. After several guys asked Natalie out and were turned down, people just accepted that we were together, even though we hadn't officially announced anything. After college, we both got jobs to pay rent while we tried to figure out our careers. Natalie soon got a job as a secretary, while I still had two more years to study to become a paralegal. As soon as I graduated, I started interviewing with different lawyers and firms. Of all the places I interviewed, I thought I had the best future with Gunner. He was an associate of one of the city's largest law firms, quickly moving toward becoming a partner and more ambitious than the law allowed. I saw Gunner move from law to politics and beyond. If I could hitch my wagon to a star, I could do it. Six months after I started working for Gunner, his secretary simply quit. Gunner wanted me to interview potential candidates to replace her. In our office, secretaries only did clerical work. They typed documents, made phone calls, and made coffee. My job was to handle all the legal matters that Gunner didn't have time for. I did research, reviewed case files that might be relevant to the cases we are working on, and compiled documents. Hiring a secretary wasn't technically part of my job description, but that just showed how much Gunner believed in me. I wanted to do my job as best as possible. Was it painful for me that the best possible candidate was my own wife? Just not for me. And Gunner seemed to like Natalie as soon as she walked through the door. He looked at me and said, You made a great choice. Natalie is tall, but very slim. She has short golden blonde hair and is always smiling. Her brown eyes seem to light up every room she enters. She has a very outgoing personality and can usually be relied upon. She will be the soul of any party. She and Gunner became the closest of friends almost immediately. Maybe I'm just stupid, 
Maybe I should have foreseen what would happen between them from the very beginning. Maybe all this is my fault. If I had never given Nat this job, it would still be mine. I started the Jeep and drove back home. Almost as soon as I started the car, my phone rang. I looked at my iPhone screen and saw that Nat was calling. I didn't bother to answer him. As soon as I got to our apartment, I started throwing my clothes and personal items into duffel bags, plastic bags, garbage bags, and anything else I could find. Every time I had a couple of bags ready, I would run downstairs and load them into my Jeep. I put all my clothes, toiletries, and personal items in the Jeep. I still had room for electronics and my computer. I put my laptop in the front seat where it would be safe and went back to the apartment to get a new download. I unplugged my TV from the cable box and realized I would need either help or a dolly to move it. If I lower the rear seats and lay them on top of my clothes to create a soft surface, I can easily put him in the back seat. I called down and the building manager was only too happy to lend me a cart so I could move it. Unfortunately, he was unable to help me move it due to his bad back. I put the TV on the cart and wheeled it down the hall to the elevator in less time than it takes to talk about it. I carefully placed the TV on the ledge of the back of the Jeep and grabbed the bottom to push the cart out from under it. I took a deep breath and tried to summon up some of the anger I felt when I saw my boss with my wife. It worked. My rage gave me more than enough strength to lift the television and push it into the back seat of the Jeep. I decided to look around the apartment one last time to make sure I didn't leave anything behind that I couldn't do without. I grabbed a few more trinkets and was just finishing cleaning up when she walked in. She took one look at me and burst into tears. So this is how you solve our problems? She screamed. You just grab your junk and run off somewhere? I didn't say a word. I was too close to tears myself. What happened to the fact that you promised to love me all the days of your life as long as you live? She asked with tears in her eyes. It did the trick. Was this bitch trying to use our marriage vows against me after what she just did? What happened to the fact that you were only for me? I immediately shot back. I did this for us, she said, trying to move closer to me. How can your betrayal do anything for us? I spat. If you would just calm down and let me explain it, you would understand, she said. There's no need to calm down, I told her. Now I am calm. I had the opportunity to think things through. You'd be surprised how everything falls into place when you're rummaging through someone's things while you're packing up to get the hell away from them. What are you talking about? She asked. Gunner wasn't the first man you cheated on me with, was he? I asked. She couldn't meet my gaze. There's no need to deny it, Nat. I found your fucking pills. We both know that with me you don't need them. But it was just curiosity, she retorted. Bullshit, Natalie, followed my retaliatory attack. You used this phrase in relation to me earlier. Then you tried out a few guys because you were curious, remember? I was the only one who entered into our relationship without sexual experience. You had a chance to experiment. You said it was for both of us. So it was. And this too, she said. We talked about having a baby, right? Then I started laughing. Let me guess. You only did this for the sake of the child, right? How the hell is Gunner supposed to get you pregnant while you're on the pill? Tell me, Nat. The woman I've loved most of my life. Do you know what it's like to have the woman you love cheat on you? But, she began. Leave it, I said. I'm leaving. I don't want to talk anymore. I'm in too much pain and I'm too angry. I might say something you'll regret. Gunner wants you to get back to work, she said. He wants us all to sit down and talk about it like rational adults. To hell with Gunner, I objected. Wait, you already did that. That's why we're here. He's not the only lawyer in town. I'll call you tomorrow to let you know who I found. If you're applying for a job at another law firm, let me know when they have an opening for me, she said. I liked that we worked together. I'd hate not to see you for most of the day again. Natalie, you're not going to see me at all, I said. I will hire another lawyer to handle my side of the divorce case. We're not going to get a damn divorce, she suddenly blurted out. We are going to be together forever, just like we always said. It's bad, I know. I was wrong, and I'm sorry. But this is not the end for us. I won't allow this. If I have to bankrupt both of us, 
I will fight for it. I slammed the door and just walked out. She opened it behind me and ran down the corridor screaming, Jill, I love you. Please do not leave me. Mason, you have an appointment at 11 o'clock. My secretary's voice over the intercom pulled me out of my thoughts. I shook my head and silently laughed at myself. I turned five years old last week, and I still found myself dreaming about my wife. After her death, I took two years off. I originally wanted to take a year off, but I found that even after a year, I just wasn't ready to jump back into life. Three years later, I still found myself simple, I going about my duties. Almost every time I had free time, I found myself wondering what she would think about this or that. I wondered why too. They always say that flying is the safest way to travel. I heard all these bullshit statistics. An airline employee told me that last year alone more than 34,000 people died in car accidents, but from 1982 to now, there have been only 364 fatalities among people traveling on airplanes. That's 364 people over 30 years of work on airplanes versus 34,000 a year on cars. However, it doesn't really matter when one of those people is the one you intended to spend the rest of your life with. When your mind and all your senses become accustomed to a person, numbers cease to have any meaning. When your muscle memory gets used to hugging a soft, warm body in the middle of the night, the numbers become a lie. When, should I send her here? She asked. Anne's voice came through the intercom again, stopping me from returning to my thoughts. Yes, Anne, I answered. Let her in. I tried to smile. I wanted to make my potential new client feel like I could help her. It's funny that no matter how much experience you have, clients tend to believe that you are the best lawyer or something like that if you smile when you first meet them. Perhaps projecting sadness or dissatisfaction into one's own life indicates an inability to help them with their lives. The door opened slowly, almost cautiously, and my jaw immediately dropped. Good morning. I started even before the words got stuck in my throat, and I began to smile. I stood up and rushed across the room to shake her hand, but somehow the friendly, professional handshake turned into a hug, and she started crying and holding me even tighter. Normally this wouldn't be a problem, but when the person you're hugging is Jill Black, it's a problem. Well, there were actually two problems, and they were pretty darn serious. Jill, what happened? I asked her. I'm so sorry, honey, I didn't know it was you. I thought it was just another client. I didn't know it was you either, Mr. Wright, she sobbed. But I'm a client. What happened, Jill? I asked. What do you want me to do? I need a divorce, she said. She could hardly hold back her tears. I could tell she was really upset. Jill, have you had lunch today? I asked it. She shook her heed, causing a stream of inky black waves to fall over her shoulders. Her bottom lip stuck out like a petal and child's, and I thought again of all the disappointment she must have caused hundreds of teenage boys at an early age, not to mention grown men in the years to come. I stood up and grabbed her hand. We're going to have lunch and you can tell me about it, I said. Everything seems to get better when you share it with someone. In addition, it is more difficult to feel unhappy on a full stomach. Didn't I teach you this when you were 16 and trying to learn to drive? You mean when I destroyed my neighbor's fence and scratched my dad's car, and you helped me fix the fence because he didn't? She asked, smiling. I simply nodded. An hour later, after ordering sirloin medallions from Texas Roadhouse, Jill was ready to talk. Okay, Jill, why do you need a divorce? I asked. Start from the beginning and tell me everything. She told me a story I had never heard before. Jill and Natalie were my daughter Melanie's best friends before she got married and moved on with her life. My daughter and I were still close, so I would have to tell her that I ran into Jill. Of course, I couldn't talk about the details or anything else about Jill's case if it actually turned out to be one. But I could mention that I saw her. Of the three girls, Jill was the most memorable. My own daughter Melanie was the pretty girl next door type. Natalie was a tall, thin model and Jill looked like someone out of Playboy, but she just didn't seem to understand what she had. Natalie's body was almost boyish, with her slender hips and tiny breasts. It was her personality more than anything else that attracted people to her. Melanie was about in the middle. She had a beautiful body, and she was proud of it. 
Jill, however, must have been wearing a size 4 bra. She was slim but curvy, and even my wife commented on her figure. She used to joke that Jill's breasts showed up in the room two minutes before she did, and her ass was still there two minutes after she left. Jill could probably drive the boys crazy, but she seemed to hold on to that boyish demeanor for much longer than anyone would have expected. It wasn't that she went out and played football or anything. She was extremely feminine. It was just that long after she should have started chasing boys, she still preferred to hang out with Mal and Nat. There were a lot of disappointed boys then. I tried not to reek when Jill explained to me that she and Natalie had actually grown up, stayed together, and gotten married. Our state was one of the first to allow same-sex marriage, and they took advantage of it. Everything went fine, except for a few skirmishes with stupid people. Of course, they had their ups and downs, like most young couples. But until yesterday, when Jill walked in and caught Natalie cheating, her life had been great. Jill, divorce is a really important step, I said. Are you sure there's no other way to deal with this? She shook her head. I thought about it all night, Mr. Wright. Natalie lied to me for a long time. There's no way I want to go back to this. What about a consultation? I asked. It won't work, she said. Counseling is only useful when both parties believe there is a chance to save the relationship and are willing to work on it. But not me. I'm just asking questions the way any lawyer would, I replied. And I appreciate it, she smiled brushing all that dark hair out of her eyes. Most people act like we're some kind of weirdos. Okay, we'll have to look at your finances and decide what you'd like to see happen, I said. So will you take my case? She asked excitedly. Have you ever had any doubts? I returned. Mr. Wright, she began. We're both adults now, Jill. You can call me Mason, I said. Mason, you've always been special to me, but you'll never believe how many people turned their backs on us when Nat and I decided we wanted to be together. Her family, my family, and many of our old friends will have nothing to do with us. She looked at me and lowered her eyes a little. That's how I lost you, she said. What do you mean? I asked. When some guys noticed that, we met very close. They started making comments and jokes about it. Then Melanie seemed to distance herself from us. I can't say I blamed her. In high school, it was all about fitting in. But when she stopped hanging out with us, I could no longer see you and ask you for advice. She lowered her head as if trying to hide her face as she said, I think I missed you more than I missed her. The last three days have been absolute hell. Over the past few days, I have gone through a difficult emotional period. This morning, I woke up in a negative mood due to Gunner's presence. He tried to show intimacy, but I was not in the mood for it. We had a tense conversation during which Gunner showed disregard for my feelings and personal boundaries. He allowed himself inappropriate behavior and manipulation. His actions caused me psychological discomfort and left negative consequences. After this incident, I began to reflect on my relationship and childhood memories of my parents' interactions. It made me think about the reasons for my own confusion in interpersonal relationships. The situation showed the need to establish healthy boundaries and respect in partnerships. I guess I saw myself as my father and Jill as my mother. I would go out and get all the sex I craved, and Jill's job would be to love me and forgive me. Our marriage was no different from anyone else's. At least I could say that I have never had a relationship with any woman other than Jill. Every time I cheated on her, it was always with men. Maybe I loved both men and women. I loved women and slept with men. But Gunner was right about one thing. I really missed Jill at that moment. She was what I needed right now. She could completely erase that asshole Gunner from my memory. Just as I was thinking about Jill, the doorbell rang. I grabbed my robe and opened the door. I smiled at the young woman standing there. She was beautiful, tall and thin, just like me. She did have bigger breasts but who didn't? She was chewing gum and just looked bored. Are you, um, Natalie Perry? She asked. I nodded. Are there any documents? She continued. Of course, I said. Please come in. What's the matter? I asked. It's all routine, she said. Here, she said, handing me the folder. What is this? I asked. 
You have been served, she said, and my eyeballs were burned. I'll have to go make love with some random guy just to get my sanity back. Disgusting. I stood in the doorway, stunned. I opened the folder and there they were, freshly minted divorce papers. Jill tried to divorce me. She didn't sit somewhere and cry for me. She didn't try to overcome her pain and come back to me. She was finished. Jill moved on with her life without me, something my mother never had the strength to do. I've never been prone to emotional outbursts or anything like that, but this time it was different. I plopped down on the floor. The robe was still open and the door was wide open, and I wondered where I had gone wrong. Was there someone else with Jill? Was she somewhere with another woman even as I sat there trying not to cry? As I collapsed on the floor, a young couple passed me along the corridor heading towards the elevator. The guy couldn't take his eyes off my almost naked body, but his girlfriend quickly reined him in. Stop staring at her, she spat. It won't do you any good. Either way, you know she loves women. She looked at me angrily. It took me a while to pull myself together. It just goes to show you that no matter how confident you are in how you play the game, you can get beat. It really doesn't take much effort to upset an apple cart. One bored-looking woman changed the entire paradigm of my life by simply making me sign for a folder of documents that I didn't actually need. The worst part about it all was the fact that I was the one who caused it. Until now, I have walked through life always knowing that I am one step ahead of everyone I encounter. I'm young, I'm attractive, and I crave everything I can experience. I know there's nothing wrong with that, but at the same time, I was smart enough to know that I needed to be grounded and have something to fall back on when everything went to hell, and Jill has always been like that. I learned early on that most men are assholes and simply cannot be relied upon. I love my dad more than I can ever express, but he was and is an asshole. He cheated on my mom all the time. Even now that I'm grown up, he's a jerk. As soon as he found out that I was a carpet weaver, as he called me, he turned his back on me. I probably got my sexual attraction from my father, but my tastes are a little more varied. I like both men and women equally, but no matter who I have sex with, I know there is a difference between love and sex. I love Jill. Sexually, she is a little stunted. Everything with her was always gentle and loving, but sometimes I just needed more variety than that. Jill has always been my best friend, the person you can rely on no matter what. She was always on my side, whether I was right or wrong. And when I think about my life 50 years from now, I like to imagine us as those two little old men sitting on the porch in their rocking chairs. Of course, no one would ever think that these two old ladies aren't sitting there, whiling away their dying years, reminiscing about their glory days with their husbands. They also won't suspect that these two old ladies come into their house every night and are engaged in love. But now that future is under threat. I knew that Jill was not stupid and that someday she might find out what I was doing. A lot of guys tried to break us up. They especially wanted Jill, even though I was the most outgoing. When we finally gave in to the tension that had built up between us for years and made love, there was no turning back. We both experienced emotional struggles for years. I had kissed a few guys before but found it unsatisfying, mainly because they were too rough, too fast, and too selfish. I loved what Jill and I did. Jill, on the other hand, was an enigma. She told me for years that there was a boy she liked, but she could never have him. Since he was off limits, she tried to find someone else who would make her feel as loved as he did, and that person was me. So we were together for completely different reasons, but we worked. Jill was with me for the love I made her feel, and I was with her for the sex and security, but we worked until now. Now I really screwed up and lost her. I had not one, but two plans to deal with this situation. The first one was the same one I used earlier when she found out I had sex with a guy after we met. She got angry at me and broke up with me. We spent a little time apart and finally ran into each other and started talking. I cried my eyes out and told her how much I missed her. I told her I only did it because I wanted to be sure. I told her that what we were doing was going to be a very long, very difficult journey, and that we shouldn't go on this journey together unless we were sure. I tried a guy just to get over my curiosity 
about what it would be like to have sex with a man, and it wasn't nearly as good as what we were doing. This was not entirely true. In fact, I liked both. Actually, I just liked sex. Men and women just tasted different. Anyway, Jill, like my mother did with my father, forgave me, and so far we have been back together without any problems. This time I used the it's just sex phrase on her, and she didn't eat. So I tried my other plan. I told her that I only slept with Gunner so he could get me pregnant. We were talking about having kids, so I thought it might work. Unfortunately, the bitch went through my stuff and found my pills, so she didn't buy it. For the first time in my memory, I felt lonely. Gunner doesn't give a damn about me. He just wants sex. If he didn't have me, he would have to pay women of easy virtue. Gunner's sex drive is probably even stronger than mine, and his wife can't even come close to handling it. However, he also needs his wife. Her family connections will pave the way for the political career he dreams of, so he will get what he needs outside of their marriage. When we first got together, it seemed perfect. We both had a lot to lose, so neither of us could afford to be stupid. We only got together once or twice a month, usually if Jill and I had a day off. If I had taken the day off, I would have called Jill and told her how much I missed her and how much I loved her, and then met Gunner at the motel. If Jill had a day off, Gunner and I would just do nasty things right in his office. It worked really well until it didn't, and we got caught. Since then, Gunner has been using me as his personal toy. He forced me to do things that I just didn't like. In fact, what he seems to like most is that it makes me uncomfortable. The worst thing is that even at work, he expects me I'll fix it missing out on Jill's departure until he finds another paralegal. From now on, the company decided to select personnel for it itself. His last two secretaries mysteriously quit. They just quit. Like Jill did. I'm guessing the firm is trying to figure out why he has such a high turnover rate. I don't think they have any idea why Jill left. Jill herself is silent and has not returned to the office since she left. She didn't even return to pick up her personal belongings. I collected all her things and decided that I would give them to her the next time I saw her. At the time, I was sure it would happen, but it's almost as if Jill had disappeared off the face of the earth. She didn't return my calls for the first week or so, and I left her so many messages that I filled up her voicemail. Apparently, she didn't listen to them if the mailbox was full. After that, she changed her phone number, and no one I talked to knew the new number, and if they did, they certainly didn't give it to me. Finally, I managed to close the door and get to the sofa. I took a sleeping pill and just passed out. In the two weeks since Jill first walked into my office, we've gotten together to work on her divorce three or four times. We entered into a settlement agreement and set up a meeting with Natalie and her lawyer, but encountered several obstacles along the way. The first came from the judicial system. As far as I know, no one has ever dealt with a divorce between two women. After all, it's only been a little less than a year since same-sex marriage was legalized in this state. Nobody really knew how to handle it, and I was grateful that there were no children involved because that would have been a real nightmare. It's strange, but while most divorces are settled without a legal battle and all the judge has to do is seal the settlement agreement approved by both parties, everyone seemed to want this case to go before the judge. Perhaps it was simply the strangeness of what was happening. Perhaps they were thinking of using this incident as a template for what would happen in the future, but I didn't think so. My goal was to get this over with as quickly as possible and minimize the pain and emotional trauma that Jill had to go through. Over the past two weeks, it has been nice to see that she has at least partially overcome her pain. The great thing was that when she came in yesterday to talk about what to expect at today's meeting, she smiled. It wasn't one of those, I'm completely free of my pain, smiles. This was even better. It was a, I'm really glad to see you smile. I have to admit that Jill and I had parallel recoveries. While she deals with her pain by focusing on moving forward, I finally started to pull my head out of my ass about my wife's death and understand that she would want me to live and move on. This morning, when Jill walked into my office, my breath caught. 
Even though I tried to think of her as the little girl whose hand I held through so many of life's ups and downs when she was younger, I found myself looking at her and feeling ashamed of myself. She dressed for the meeting in a blue dress that should have been declared illegal. It ended about 15 centimeters below her knee, so it was perfect for the meeting. The problem was that the dress was tight to the body. The dress seemed to highlight the size and fullness of her breasts. Then it hugged her stomach and flared out to highlight the curve of her hips. A slightly plunging neckline wouldn't be a problem for a lesser person, but in Jill's case, her cleavage became the focal point of not only the dress, but the entire room. All eyes were focused on the valley between these breasts. Does this look normal? She asked. I had to look away from her and take a few seconds to collect my thoughts. Her smoky black hair was curled in ringlets that fell over her shoulders. Her big, innocent blue eyes not only complemented the incredible dress, but also stood out strikingly against her black curtain of hair. Her lips blew me away. They were plump and smiling and wearing something I had never seen before. Her lipstick wasn't even close to being real unless you were from a comic book. In fact, her lipstick was the same color as her dress. Those blue lips did something to me. Below the neck, it only got worse. No matter how hard I tried to remain professional and remind myself that this woman was young enough to be my daughter, I couldn't take my eyes off her chest. However, there must have been a draft in the office because I saw a shiver run through her body. She bent down and pulled a tiny sweeter from the bag she was carrying. The sweeter was waist length and very thin, but it provided another layer of coverug on her chest and kept it from being obvious to everyone present. You look stunning, I said. This old thing, she said, looking at me with curiosity. Do I look stunning for a meeting or stunning in general? She held my gaze and refused to look away. Luckily, Penny, my assistant, came into the room and broke the tension. As we left the room to head to the meeting, I couldn't help but notice the incredible way her waist was narrowed by that sweater and formed into a mouth-watering butt. For the first time since my wife died, I looked at a woman as a woman. The problem was that this woman was the same age as my daughter and that she was simply not attracted to men. There was also the issue of professional ethics. In fact, if everything had gone according to plan, the issue of ethics would probably have arisen very soon. As we approached the building where I had worked for the past three years, I felt strange. I was a little angry, too. I sat in Penny's car as she drove us to the meeting because I was too nervous to drive myself. The funny thing about all this was that I never thought about Natalie. I have not seen or received any messages from Natalie for over two weeks. Every day it became easier for me to live without her. All my feelings came from another source. First of all, I was angry because I was stuck in the car with Penny. Penny wasn't a bad person, and she was actually very professional. She kept asking me questions, but avoided what she really wanted to ask me. Penny is a legal secretary. She's very close to becoming a paralegal, so she's been asking questions about classes and stuff, but I can tell by the way she's looking at me that she wants to ask what it's like to be with another woman. She's curious about it. Since she is stocky and not very attractive, she wonders... Since her relationships with men have not been very successful, what it would be like to be with another woman. The problem is that she's barking up the wrong damn tree. I can't really tell her anything because I don't know. All the terms they use to describe who they think I am don't really apply to me. I just see myself as an individual. It is very difficult. When I was a teenage girl, I fell in love with a man I could never have, and I guess I just decided that if I couldn't have him, I would take his advice and wait for the person who made me feel that way. The same as him. In fact, he never knew. We talked about boys, and he told me to wait for the guy who makes me feel really special. He told me that I would know when I met him because I would just feel loved. He told me that teenage girls fell in and out of love with each other in the blink of an eye, but whoever I loved, I had to wait for someone who really loved me. The problem was that I vowed to wait for this person, but I never found him. So I settled on the first person who made me feel that way, and that was she. So now that I'm divorcing her, he's back in my life, or I'm back in his, and I've discovered that he's not as unattainable as I previously thought. It seemed like fate to me. 
The problem was that he didn't even give me any hint as to whether I might be interested in him or not. He invited me to lunch several times and was the person I turned to for advice and even comfort during this difficult period. In fact, he treated me exactly the same as when I was a little girl. It was almost like old times. I fell off the bike and skinned my knees, and he washed them and put a Band-Aid on them. He kissed the tip of his finger and then pressed it gently against the patch, and I felt invincible. I wanted him to kiss me when I was an adult and see if they felt the same. So, even though I didn't need to dress for this meeting, I bought a new dress. I dressed for him. I needed to see if there would be a reaction. When I entered the room, I realized that he was stunned. It was so sweet. He tried his best not to look at me. So I asked him if I looked good. He found it difficult to answer. Finally, he told me that I looked stunning. That's when everything turned upside down. That was the look he gave me more than anything else in the world. Suddenly, I was that little girl again, and I wanted him so bad. He was my knight in shining armor, and I wanted to be saved. He was once again that man that none of the boys could compare to. It wasn't that I forgot Natalie any faster. I just realized that Natalie was just a temporary measure. She was someone who could take the place of the person I really wanted. The problem for me was that there were too many things I didn't know about boy-girl relationships. Then Penny showed up and blocked me. She was funny, polite, and completely professional. But she stood in my way. The worst moment was when we were heading to the parking lot. I announced that I was too nervous to drive, so Penny suggested we all go together. I could have hugged her for that, but then we realized that there was simply no way for all three of us to fit comfortably in Mason's Mustang. I had my hand on the passenger door handle when Penny suggested we all fit in either my Jeep or, since I didn't want to drive, her Ford Explorer. Mason thought it was a great idea but said he didn't leave his baby anywhere. So he decided to go there by car and let Penny and I go together. Great, Penny said enthusiastically. We can continue our girl talk and give you the opportunity to relax. I smiled brightly, wondering if she could tell that I was thinking about knocking out her teeth. If she hadn't shown up, Mason and I would be squeezed in in this small car together. In fact, I wondered why he insisted on taking her with him. Penny chatted incessantly throughout the 20-minute drive there. By the time we arrived, as sweet as she was, I hated the sound of her voice. It felt strange to walk through the building and return to the office that the three of us had shared for so long. I extended my hand and Mason gently grabbed it. The contact between us made every hair on my body stand on end. We could stand there forever, holding hands, and I wouldn't mind. Let me, he said. I smiled and nodded. He entered the office and I followed him. Penny brought up the rear. Natalie was sitting at her desk and stood up as soon as we entered. She was wearing a blouse and a skirt that didn't look good together. Even though it had been barely two weeks since we last saw each other, she looked much worse. If possible, she looked thinner, and her face seemed drawn and her eyes puffy. I'd never really liked the tattoos that covered her entire right arm, but suddenly they really pissed me off. Nat is a beautiful girl, but those tattoos made her look cheap and stupid. We are meeting in the conference room, she said, leading us into the room. She ran out for coffee and a plate of pastries. Gunner will be here in a few minutes, she said when she returned. Before we begin, can I please talk to you in private, Jill? No, Mason said quietly. We are here to resolve your differences and, if possible, not bring it to court. During the meeting, I would be grateful if we could limit ourselves to current issues only. After the meeting, if you two want to talk, you can exchange phone numbers or arrange to meet at any location convenient for you. But unless you two have decided that this meeting is not necessary, we must do this according to the rules. Do any of you think we should cancel or reschedule the meeting? He asked. I don't do this, I said quietly but sternly. Let's have a meeting. I looked away from Natalie and sank into a chair. Mason sat down on one side of me, and Penny sat at the opposite end of the table. Natalie's shoulders slumped, and she left the room. When we were alone, Mason asked me a couple of questions. Is Gunner the same guy she cheated with? He asked. I nodded my head and barely contained my disgust. Mason smiled. 
and I wondered why. Looks like you might have a little revenge, he said. Luckily, I took Penny with me. But... I started. When did Natalie get all these tattoos? He asked. I just shrugged. Do you have any? He asked. I smiled and started to think of a flirty answer, but Gunner entered the room. As usual, he was in a sharp suit and boastful. He came up to me and reached out to me as if he wanted to hug me. I started to cringe, but there was no need for that. Mason leaned over me and extended his hand. Mason Wright, he said. I was excited for two reasons. First of all, Mason rushed to my defense as usual, and I loved seeing him fight for me, even if it was just to keep me out of trouble. The second reason was that due to the awkwardness of the position, Mason's torso was rubbing against my chest, and this touch turned me on more than I could ever imagine. I hope you don't mind, but I brought my own stenographer with me to record the proceedings, he said. No problem, Gunner replied. I will act on behalf of Natalie. Hopefully we can come to an agreement so there is no need to go to court. I hope even more that these two young ladies can iron out their differences and be together again. Natalie stood behind Gunner and nodded her head. This is what I would really like, she said. I couldn't hold back any longer. It's easy to say that when you're not the one who was lied to or cheated on, I snapped. It's easy to want to make things right when you're not the one who got hurt. Mason grabbed my wrist under the table. I knew he needed me to shut up. Since it appears we must continue, Gunner said, my client would like to suggest that both parties attend relationship counseling in hopes of reconciliation. My client does not want to reconcile and wants to move on with the divorce. Since they have no material assets other than their personal belongings, my client would like to simply leave. She does not offer any alimony or spousal support and is generally willing to agree to a divorce, according to because of irreconcilable differences, not because of adultery, so that your client's reputation is not damaged, Mason said. Oh, excuse me, where is my head? First we need to sign a couple of papers to indicate who we all are and what's going on. He handed the paper to Gunner for him to sign. He also asked Natalie and I to sign it. He then had us sign again that we all agreed to Penny recording the meeting. Isn't all this old-fashioned? Gunner asked. We already know each other. Most of this is just useless documentation. Yes, I'm a little old-fashioned, Mason said. But you never know. Under the table, Mason hit me on the leg, and I realized that he had just somehow struck Gunner. Okay, Gunner smiled. Let's start with the basics. I'm going to be honest and just lay all our cards on the table. Jill, Natalie is miserable without you. She wants to apologize and go to counseling to try and get back what you two had. To tell you the truth, I need you to get back to work too. It's just that the office and my practice aren't running nearly as smoothly as they used to. What exactly needs to be done to make this happen? You'll need a time machine for this, I spat. Mr. Peabody, you'll have to ask your boyfriend Sherman to start the return machine and take us back to the time when Natalie first started cheating on me. In fact, this will not be enough. You'll have to give me some kind of medicine or treatment to erase my memory so I won't be haunted by visions of the man who swore to love, honor, and stay with me for the rest of my life, having sex with the meanest lawyer I know. It should also stop me from having nightmares where I'm sitting at home trying to make sure we're okay while Nat sleeps with every random man he can find. I'll also need something to make me trust her again, and something else to make me respect her, all just so we can get even. If you're talking about making amends to me, then... Natalie began to cry and ran out of the room. Penny quickly ran after her. What's wrong with her? I asked. Don't you think you were a little harsh? Gunner asked. He still had that smug look on his face, and it occurred to me that he actually enjoyed seeing Natalie get hurt. The look on your face, he said. It was pure hatred. I can't believe you went from worshipping her two weeks ago to almost hating her now. I think you're still in shock. I'm almost afraid to ask how you feel about me. I don't think you want to know how I feel about you, I said, and his smile disappeared. Are you at least willing to consider giving this a short period of time before just breaking off the relationship? He asked. 
At this point, Penny and Natalie returned to the room. No, that's not true, I said, and my answer was directed more at Natalie than at Gunner. I think I've just been too damaged by all of this to ever trust her again. The only chance we have is to be completely honest with each other and try to remain friends. If we finally break up and are completely honest with each other, then maybe we can start over. But this time, before I get into a relationship with her, we have to set certain ground rules about what each of us can and what we cannot do. The first step in this direction would be to end the divorce so we can start over. Maybe after the divorce is final, we could talk and move on. Natalie listened to the entire conversation. Mason wasn't the only one who could be made fun of. I had no intention of ever returning to Nat. Like I said, she hurt me too much, but I wanted her to think that if she agreed to the divorce, we would have a chance. When we sat down again, Gunner started again. I think what you tried to do earlier was a bluff, he told Mason. You agree to irreconcilable differences only because you have no evidence of adultery. You have no photos or videos to prove anything. And how do you know this? Mason asked. Gunner quickly turned green with embarrassment. He drank the water in one gulp and cleared his throat. Well, in this state, the reason for divorce is not really... He began. I did it, Natalie said quietly. Ah, shut up, Nat, Gunner hissed. Your confession is the same as the fact that they have evidence. If you admit to adultery and we end up in front of a judge, you could end up with a worse outcome in the settlement. What is the settlement? Natalie asked. We have no money, we don't have anything expensive, our apartment is rented, and right now, Jill doesn't even have a job. What can any judge take from us or force us to divide? She still has some of her things in her apartment and some from her office. I would give it all back to her whenever she wanted. I just want this to end so we can start over. Give me the papers and I'll sign them. Jill, can you promise that when this is all over, we can talk? I looked across the table and nodded my head. She took a pen and signed the papers. I know you're so mad at me right now that you probably don't want to talk to me, she said. But I need you to know that I really love you and I'm not happy without you. I guess I just didn't realize how important you are to me. I was just stupid and greedy. I wanted to have my cake and eat it too. I guess, after all, I am my father's daughter. Then she got up and left the room. This time she managed to leave the room before she started crying. Gunner looked at me and smiled. Okay, so what does this give us? He asked. Your divorce is settled. Once the paperwork is filled in court, hopefully around tomorrow, we will set a date to appear before the judge. He will stamp the papers, and in 60 days, you will become a free woman. Of course, from the date you submit your documents, you can legally go out and start courting another woman. So, theoretically, by tomorrow evening, you could find yourself in some other woman's bed. Since everything is settled, have you considered returning to work for me? We'll be in touch, Mason said, taking my hand and standing up. Good luck in your career. Gunner looked funny, then smiled. So you followed my career? He asked. Did a good job of researching your opponent. You are a smart person. Mason simply smiled when we left. Grr. I started growling as we left the room. Shh, Mason answered, smiling. I hate that bastard, I snapped. He got away with it again. Shh, Mason said, reaching out and taking my hand. This contact was enough to calm me down. I immediately shut my mouth, thinking back to the time he held my hand while I tried to master the float in the backyard pool. I tried to swim both on my back and on my stomach, but I couldn't do it. My own father loved me, but he just didn't have the patience to try to teach me. Mason, however, told me to relax and let it happen. I always panicked and worried that my face would end up in the water. In the end, he just told me to close my eyes and held my hand the whole time. He told me that if I got scared, I would just squeeze his hand and he would pull me out of the water. I swam great. I don't know if it was because I wasn't worried anymore or just because of the magic of him holding my hand. But after that, I was never afraid of anything. So having Mason hold my hand in the elevator was magical. I'd rather have him hold my hand than make comments about Gunner any day. As soon as we left the building and returned to the parking lot, Mason began to talk. 
I have no idea if their elevators have listening devices, he said. I didn't want to reveal our cards. But, Mason, the issue of divorce has been resolved, I said. And now the revenge begins, he grinned. Mason, believe it or not, I said, but I don't want any revenge on Natalie. I loved her for a long time and she hurt me a lot, but it's over. I have an idea that she is going to pay for it in her own way, and maybe she has already paid, but I don't have to do anything with it. I just want to move on and live my life. The best revenge is a life well lived. You are even more special than the young woman I remember, he said. For a while back there, I really thought you were just misleading her when you talked about just working out the divorce so you two could get back together. Um, it is, I admitted, smiling. I have no intention of ever returning to Nat. She lied to me and cheated on me for a long time. She only stopped because she was caught. I don't need to punish her, but I will never be with her again. So we don't need to take revenge on her. I also never talked about revenge on Natalie, he said. I don't do a lot of divorces, but when I do, the person being cheated on usually wants revenge on the person who took their spouse away from them. Are you saying you don't want Gunner to get a little punishment? I would like it, I admitted. Penny, have you collected everything? He asked. Yes, I did it. She smiled. I have names, signatures, and everything else. Meet me in the office later, he said. I'm going to have lunch with Jill one last time to discuss our plans. Penny got into her car and drove away, waving at me as she pulled out of the parking lot. Are you minding lunch again? Mason asked. Your dress really deserves a more elaborate place, but I really need to go back and collect the papers. I want to start the process as quickly as possible, but to be honest, I'm really becoming addicted to these stakes. It's been five years since my wife died, and I haven't really been out since. I may be overdosing on Texas Roadhouse very soon, although maybe someone will take you to a place worthy of this dress after you've had time to properly forget Nat. Oh, I'm fine with any place you want to take me, I said. I immediately wished I had phrased it differently, but looking back, I realized that I said what I meant. How are we going to get revenge on Gunner? I asked. He's quite a slimy bastard and has connections with some powerful people. You know he's just using the law as a stepping stone to politics, right? The steps may become slippery. If you slip off one of them, you could fall on your butt and end up hurting yourself really bad, Mason said. Gunner was right. I did a little research about it. He hurt one of my favorite people. Well, two, actually. So he deserves what's coming to him. Who did he hurt? I asked. As a child, you, Nett, were my daughter's best friends, he began. I felt almost as if I had three daughters instead of one. Then he lowered his head to his plate, as if he was about to say something difficult. I really missed you when you girls grew apart, he said quietly. I became so nervous that I began to wonder if he could hear my heart beating. Suddenly I didn't care about getting revenge on Gunner or anything else. So, are you ready for this? He asked. Anytime, anywhere, I blurted out. Okay, he said. We're going to hit him on three different fronts at the same time. We're going to take everything he has. We are going to hire him at the company. We're going to take away his license and we're going to take away his marriage and with it, his chances of going into politics. I blushed when I realized he was still talking about Gunner, not about us, a week passed after the meeting with Jill and her lawyer. At first, I didn't understand who her lawyer was. It took a couple of days for it to finally dawn on me. Jill's lawyer was the father of our old friend Melanie. Jill walked into the office looking literally so much that I wanted to eat it. I didn't know where she got that blue dress, but it was incredible. The blue color set off her beautiful eyes so well that I just felt like a fool. Every man in the building talked about her after she left, as did half the women. I couldn't believe I risked losing her to Gunner. The worst part was that Gunner was still forcing me to do things I didn't like. I realized that Gunner enjoyed bossing people around. He had a strong superiority complex and hated losing at anything. After the meeting, he was especially angry because he had not scored a single point during our conversation. He had to give in to every damn demand. They were not forced into counseling. 
There was no way Jill and I would be together until the divorce was over. What angered him the most was that Jill had no intention of coming back to work with us. I truly believe that after he saw her in that dress, he was most disappointed that he would no longer have the opportunity to sleep with her. He, too, became increasingly demanding at work, constantly reminding me that if he charged me a fee to file my divorce, I would probably end up paying him off for years. He constantly reminded me that I was in his debt and that when he was ready to receive the money, I would have to agree without question to whatever he wanted. I got to the point where I really didn't care. What could he do to me that would be worse than what I had already gone through? When you're used to coming home to a woman who loves you with all her being and who will do anything to make you happy, losing her is hard. Losing her because you were stupid and greedy is even harder. I kicked myself every day. Seeing her in that dress only made me kick myself harder. The door to the office opened and at the same moment the phone rang. I picked up the phone and recognized the voice of Gunner's wife, Arlene. She became very angry and demanded to speak to him. I connected it to his personal line and, okay, I'm curious, left the connection open. Ganner, get your ass home right now. The words were precise and abrupt, betraying her anger. Honey, no matter how serious the emergency, I can't just quit work, Gunner replied. The only emergency is your well-being, asshole, she said. Some time ago, there was a woman here who handed you some papers. All she said was that it was a private matter. You've been sued. I want to know why and by whom, and it better not be what I think. If you cheated on me, it's over between us, and I want. Your ass out of my house. I couldn't get this woman to tell me what this case was about. She babbled something about how she couldn't reveal the details, but I'd find out. I was able to find out the name of the law firm she represents from the card she left for you. I'm sure one of my dad's friends knows someone there who can tell me. So you better get your ass home and confess everything before I find out. I looked through the glass partition and saw that Gunner's usually tanned, smug face was white as a sheet. A call came in on another line. This was one of the partners of our company. He also seemed furious and wanted Gunner to come upstairs immediately. I promised to forward the call. I looked up and noticed that standing in front of me was the same bored-looking woman who had served me with divorce papers. I heard the door open, but in the confusion of two phone calls, it slipped my mind. She stood there chewing gum and smiling at me. I shuddered, wondering what she wanted from me this time. Relax, honey. I'm not here for you, she said. Is Gunnar Sterling here? I sighed with relief and pointed to the door of his office. Through the glass partition separating our workspaces, I saw Gunner hastily packing his briefcase, getting ready to go home. You better catch him quickly, I said. He had a hard day. It's about to get much worse, she grinned. She walked to the door and opened it. She left the door open. Gunny Highway? She asked. Gunner was furious. Didn't you see my name on this door? He shouted. I'm Gunner Sterling. It's Gunner, not Gunny, and Sterling, not Highway. My name is right on the damn door. I just needed you to introduce yourself, she said, handing him a pile of folders. There must have been at least five of them. She only gave me one, and it pretty much ruined my life. Then she turned on her heel and walked away. Don't bother having a good day, she said over his shoulder. Gunner began tearing apart the folders, and as he opened each one, he became redder and angrier. He shouted for me to come into his office. You little bitch, he shouted. You ruined my whole life. That fucking woman you were married to is trying to kill me. You need to call her back and ask her to end all this crap. Sleeping with you wasn't worth any of this. You're not even the cutest of the two of you. Before he could say anything else, we were interrupted. Sterling, this name was pronounced with obvious contempt. I turned around and recoiled at the sight of Wilton Moss, one of the founders and senior partners of our law firm. Moss was a very short man with a receding hairline and a growing belly. He walked past me as if I wasn't there and walked right up to Gunner, who towered over him. Gunner began to back away. Sterling, what kind of crap have you gotten this company into? He asked. Gunner said nothing. He was smart enough to keep his mouth shut. Don't even say anything, moron, Moss continued. I already know. Do you have any idea who he is? Mason Wright? 
Um, this is the lawyer who represented my client's wife in divorce proceedings about a week ago, Gunner said quietly. He's also one of our former partners, Moss told us both. He's an old friend of mine, and because of this, he's giving the firm a chance to avoid a very dirty and very public ass-kicking. His client is considering filing a multi-million dollar lawsuit against us. Can you guess why? Gunner started to say something, but Moss came even closer to him and said, Shut up. I asked you not to talk. Gunner visibly shrank, frightened by the short man's anger. You obviously had your secretary in your office, Moss raged. You did this in my fucking building like it was some lice-infested motel, and her wife, who I might add is a former employee of ours, is suing. They want to sue us for not complying with the morality clause. It doesn't mean much. We can probably work this out in court until we find the right judge who agrees that consenting adults do what they do. Wright knows this. He is very clever. So what he did was he connected the case with some of your former secretaries, and suddenly things started to look more serious. We might be able to kiss his ass and get him to settle out of court, but it would cost us a hell of a lot more money than you're worth to us. Even so, there is a real danger that when Mason Wright will be angry, he will believe in a scorched earth policy. That's why we always used it when some little housewife got injured at work or something like that. He has a talent for using the press to turn everyone against a big company. And in this case, we are a big company. Our only hope is to get him to calm down. I'm working on it, Gunner whined. If you give me a chance, I can fix all this. You can't do a damn thing, Moss spat. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Did you know that Wright also served on the local bar association committee? He filed several ethics cases against you. It looks like you slept with your client while the case was pending. This is true? Gunner simply nodded. You also represented a client in a case in which you were involved. This is true? Asked Moss. Gunner nodded again. But, he intervened. Didn't I tell you to shut up twice already? Moss spat. There won't be a third time. Gunner swallowed so loudly that I heard him in the next room. Did you maintain relationships with employees during company hours and try to put pressure on them by keeping them at work or promoting them over their heads? Asked Moss. Gunner hesitated, and Moss looked at him even more intently. Gunner nodded. I have a friend who works at another firm who just told me that your legal problems are growing, Moss continued. Apparently, Congressman Dennings, your wife's father, heard about this, and an employee from his former law firm was sent to your home just a few minutes ago. He is a specialist in high-profile divorces. I believe your wife is planning to divorce you. We have also received a message from the Bar Association. Due to an investigation into your alleged ethical violations, your license to practice law has been suspended, pending the outcome of your cases. No, Gunner whispered in surprise. Didn't I tell you three times to shut up? Asked Moss. You simply refused to do what I asked you to do. This is gross insubordination. My hands are tied. I've tried to support you through this crisis, but you just won't let me work with you. You're fired. Get the hell out of my building. But, said Gunner. See, I told you so, Moss snapped. It's simply impossible to work with you. He turned and left Gunner's office. I couldn't help it and my lips formed a tiny smile. Gunner got what he deserved. You're fired too, Moss said, walking past my desk. I heard him mutter something under his breath as he left the office. We don't need any tattooed women of easy virtue here. Then I wondered how Mr. Wright managed to put all these things together so quickly and so completely. His timing was perfect. He completely destroyed Gunner. I got up and started collecting my personal belongings, then I wondered if he wanted to destroy my life too, or if I was just collateral damage. Did he really want to deprive me of my livelihood, or it was just a case of someone stepping in wet shit and the things next to them getting splashed too? However, in a way, he helped me. I wondered what I would have to do to escape Gunner's clutches. Gunner had so many other things to worry about right now that he didn't have time to torment me. I would be free and able to start dating Jill again with a clear conscience in just a few weeks, when our divorce would be final. All my freedom cost me my job, and I could have found another one. Over the next few weeks, my life changed. I think some would say things have changed for the better. 
The law firm I used to work for paid me almost half a million dollars out of court. Gunner's wife was afraid of publicity and disgrace to her family's name, so she and her father paid me $100,000 to drop the lawsuit against him for breaking up my marriage. Mason told me that if the lawsuit had gone to court, I probably wouldn't have gotten anything anyway, so taking the money just made sense. I also saw that asshole Gunner turn into a shell of the man he used to be. As a result, he received almost nothing in his divorce from his wife. He was also disbarred and his case was referred to the National Bar Association, so there was very little chance that he would practice law again anywhere in the country. He eventually quietly left town and was never heard from again. I guess the reason I wasn't overjoyed was because I was alone. After all the legal issues were settled, Mason simply disappeared from my life. The worst thing was that Natalie found out my new phone number from my parents and tried to call me again. She reminded me that I owed her a meeting, but I pushed her away, reminding her that we still had almost a month before the divorce was finalized. She whined about having to wait so long and started telling me about her financial difficulties. She tried to make it seem like it was my fault that she lost her job and had trouble finding another one. I simply told her that I would call her after the divorce was finalized and hung up. Finally, a ray of sunlight broke through the darkness from the most unexpected source. I picked up the phone, thinking it was Nat calling again. I told you that I'll call you after the divorcee is finalized, I shouted. Girl, you must be mad at Nat, said a voice. Sorry, I thought you were her, I said. Jill, this is Melanie, and I'm a little mad at you, she said. Can I meet you somewhere for lunch tomorrow? Are you coming to town? I asked. I have no choice, she said. Choose a place. How about a Texas roadhouse here in town? I said. Would you choose this place? I could almost hear the grin in Melanie's voice. I'll be there at two. This way we'll have some privacy and won't have to worry about the lunch crowd. Don't dress up. I wondered what Mel could be angry with me about. I haven't seen her in almost 10 years since she started dating guys and I started with Nat. The next day after lunch, I went to the restaurant. It was almost empty and the staff were busy cleaning up after the crowd of diners. I easily noticed Melanie and approached her. The worry on her face disappeared for a moment and we looked like those two teenage girls again. Damn, these things are huge, she said. What a waste of time. Suddenly she got angry again. You know, when we were growing up, I loved you and Nat, she said angrily. And I know I screwed up, Jill. I know I was wrong, but that was ten damn years ago. I was only seventeen. I've thought about it a lot since then. You can blame it on hormones or peer pressure or whatever, but I'm truly sorry. I should have handled this differently. Mel, what the hell are you talking about? I asked. Can I finish? She asked. I nodded, and she continued ranting. Anyway, I made a lot of mistakes, but I never expected this from you, she hissed. The funny thing about all this is that even when we were young, Natalie was a walker. But Jill, you were like family to me. I loved Nat too, even though she was like that, because she taught me a lot of things, like how to go after what you want. But you were like a sister to me. My parents always bought extra things just in case you wanted or needed something. They loved you, Jill. So which one of us is it? What are you talking about? I asked. I don't... Well, either you want to get back at me for what I did, and you're trying to do it through my father, or you're just trying to hurt him for some reason, she snapped. Let me guess. You're unhappy with the amount of money he won for you in your court case, right? I didn't expect any money at all, I said. He brought me much more money than I even thought. I really don't even know who I am. Where is he? She just looked at me strangely. He's at my house, spending time with his grandchildren. I shouldn't have let him take your case. Do you realize that it took me over two years to get him to leave his fucking house after my mom died? For the past three years, he has only left the house to go to work and sometimes visit me. Then, out of the blue, he called me and canceled his visit because you showed up at his office. For weeks, I had been hearing about Jill this and Jill that. Jill is doing well. Today, Jill smiled. Jill wore that fucking blue dress he can't stop talking about. I smiled when I heard about this. One weekend, we needed him to watch the kids so we could go to my husband's work for dinner. 
We were watching TV, and it showed Angelina Jolie dressed up for one of those award shows. My husband said something stupid about her being the most beautiful dark-haired woman in the world. Before I could spank him, my dad said, You should have seen Jill in that blue dress. You would have changed your mind. I thought it was innocent and I was happy that he was going back to normal, but now, she said. So what now? I asked. She just looked at me again. What's wrong? I asked. He's all right, isn't he? Without realizing it, my voice became louder and I almost shouted at her. Um, Jill, calm down, she said. She moved her head left and right, and I followed her gaze and noticed that everyone was looking at us. Can I come and visit him to make sure he's okay? I asked. I know you don't like me or the way my life turned out, but I need to make sure he's okay. Why do you need it? She asked. Really, I can handle it. I just need to know why this is happening. Really, I just needed to know who to crush. I inherited this from my father. When someone we love gets into trouble, we tend to kill anyone who threatens them. I think we protect each other in a way. I just needed to know that you weren't doing this on purpose. Although, if that was the case, I needed to know why. She looked at me and cocked her head to the side. The waitress interrupted us by coming over to take our orders. Melanie began to smile. After the waitress left, she changed the subject and started talking about harmless things. I kept trying to bring the conversation back to her father, and she was talking about flowers or her children, and I was getting angrier by the second. Our food was brought, and she calmly began to eat hers. I snatched the fork from her hands and demanded that she tell me what was happening to her father. Oh, damn, this is too funny, she said. You have it too. I don't even know where to start dealing with this. Do I have what? I asked loudly. What's so funny about this? People started staring at us again. Jill, are you in love with my dad? She asked. Of course not, I muttered. That's right, she said. You really are like that, damn it. It's written all over your face. It's just hilarious. Okay, maybe so, I admitted. Maybe I've always been like this. I can't help it, Mel. I'm really sorry. So, when did this start? She asked, taking a bite of her steak. Then I noticed that she was chewing just like him. When we were little, I said. He was always so patient and so kind. I guess I just judged other guys and men by him and they just didn't measure up, so I ended up with... You ended up with Nat because she loved you and boys only wanted sex. Jill, boys are pretty much stupid. They are especially stupid during adolescence. They're just walking blobs of hormones, so if you put a body like yours in front of them, asking them to think is just overkill. But don't you... She asked. You mean, don't I only like women? I asked. I don't know. I really do not know. I never thought about it. In my entire life, there have only been two people I have ever loved. I fall in love with people for the way they make me feel and the way they treat me. I never thought about what gender they were. I would probably still be with Nat if she hadn't cheated on me and treated me like crap. I am very true to myself and deserve someone who wants to be with me and only me. Then you have a serious problem, she said. Good luck with that. What do you mean? I asked. She looked at me and smiled. Well, Jill, I think my dad loves you too. I've seen the look in his eyes before when he talked about you with my mother, but my dad is very old-fashioned. He thinks that what he feels for you is wrong. You're only a year older than me which means he's 19 years older than you. In his opinion, this is too big an age difference. Secondly, he thinks you like women, and my dad is very good with people, so he will never try to pressure you or even let you know that he is interested in you. He would think he was trying to influence your preferences or your lifestyle. It won't be easy. What should I do? I asked. Do what you usually do to get a guy, she said. Melanie, I never picked up boyfriend, I whined. Keep your voice down, idiot, she said. Jill, I love my dad, and I want him to be happy. Do you really want to be with him? More than anything else, I said. I looked her straight in the eyes when I said this, so she knew I was serious. 
Well, guys are different from us, she began. They don't have the same feelings as we do. They tend to use logic and other things that don't really matter. They also have a need to protect people and make things right, so you have to trick him into acting on his feelings. I don't want to deceive him, I said. I don't want everything between us to start with lies and tricks. Then you won't get it, she said. Okay, what should I do? I asked. A couple of hours after I got home from Melanie's, as I was contemplating taking a little time off from work and maybe going on a trip, my phone rang. I didn't recognize the number, so I picked up the phone just to see who it was. This Mason Wright? asked the voice on the other end of the line. Yes, that's true, I answered. Who is this? This is Moshe Slack, he said. I'm in the city center at Moe's Tavern. Do you know where is it? Yes, it's next to my office, I answered. Well, I have a lady here. She's drunk as hell, and the only thing I could find on her was your phone number. Her driver's license says her name is Jill. Do you want to come and pick her up? I have some rough company here, and if she stays here much longer like this, someone who doesn't have her best interests at heart may take her home. Don't let her leave with anyone, I said. I'll be there in ten minutes. Don't you live far outside the city? He asked. Well, I'll make sure she's okay until you get there. Then he quickly hung up. No matter how worried I was, I didn't speed up. It may have looked like I did it, but I swear I didn't. My Mustang just goes from zero to sixty very quickly. So when I jump it out in front of all these other cars at the traffic lights, it was simply because I was going over the speed limit faster than them. Okay, as soon as I got on the freeway, I sped up. But I couldn't leave Jill there alone. Why would she be at the bar next door? Once you left the central business district, downtown was not the most pleasant place to be. I walked into Moe's and found it almost empty. There were two strange-looking guys arguing, while a third was watching what was happening. One of the guys had brown hair and appeared to be drinking milk. He had a Bible in one hand, and the biggest guy was scolding him. The third guy, a black man, seemed to be trying to calm the screaming guy. The screaming guy, whose name was Homer, seemed upset that the guy with the Bible was drinking milk. He told Flanders the guy that to get into Moe's Tavern, you had to drink Duff beer. I walked up to the bar, and a guy came out of the back room. Are you Mo? I asked. He looked around. I didn't do anything, he said. You called me to come and pick up Jill, I said. He motioned for me to follow him. We went into the back room and saw her there. She was sitting lounging at her desk and, apparently, was sleeping. I called out to her quietly and she raised her head. Jill, why are you at the bar? I asked. I have nowhere else to go, she said. She slurred her words and sounded very drunk. Honey, why didn't you call me? I asked. Guys should call girls, she muttered inaudibly. Those are the rules. So why did you dress up like that just to come to some dive bar? I asked. You told me this dress looks stunning, she said. It's not about the dress. I said. It's because of the woman in it. I can't say, she muttered indistinctly. As soon as my case was closed, you disappeared, as if you had stolen something. I should have known you didn't like me. You should have just said it. I think it's because I was with a girl, right? Men don't like girls who like girls. You haven't even been around long enough for us to talk about how much I owe you for being my lawyer. You hate me so much that you wouldn't even take money from me. Mo looked at me with a crazy look. None of this is true, I said. It's all the alcohol talking. They say that most drunks say what they really mean, but are too reserved to say it when they're sober, Mo suggested. So she must believe it. I bought this stupid dress just for you, she muttered inaudibly. I wanted to please you because I like you, and I always liked it. I was involved in her divorce, I said. Mo simply nodded. Does her ID have her address on it? I asked Ed. Mo nodded. I looked at her driver's license. This is my old address, she said. I don't live there anymore. Where do you live now? I asked. In my new apartment, she said. I live there completely alone. What is your address? I asked. Home, she said. But I don't feel at home there. Then she leaned back on the table apparently falling asleep.
I need to go back to the bar, Mo said. I put one arm around Jill's neck and lifted her from the chair. I carried her through the bar to my car. The hand that wrapped around my neck held on to me, and somehow her other hand joined it. I was able to unlock the passenger door and open it. I carefully placed her in the passenger seat and fastened her seatbelt. I got into the driver's seat and drove straight home, and once there, I got out of the car and opened the door to the house. I carried her up the stairs and laid her carefully on the bed in the guest bedroom. The room was very dusty, but I decided it would be better than staying in a dirty bar full of men. I left the light on in the hallway and left the door open in case she woke up during the night. I brought a glass of juice and another glass of water and placed them on the bedside table. I was sure that when she woke up, she would be very thirsty. I have to admit that I went back and checked on her several times that evening. I stood there looking at her and admiring the curves and nuances of that beautiful body. But after the first few moments spent looking at it and noticing its curves and crevices and the differences in the sizes and proportions of the various parts, I began to look in a different direction. I couldn't take my eyes off her face. There was more to it than just the placement, size, or shape of the elements. Her whole face was simply beautiful. I'm sure it was a purely subjective thing. I mean, if we took four or five guys and asked them to look at four or five different women, we probably wouldn't agree on which one is the most beautiful or even why. All I could say was that I could look at Jill's face for the rest of my life and not regret it. I smiled, imagining what she would look like in 20 years. She would develop a few wrinkles and possibly crow's feet at the corners of her eyes, but she would still have the same face shape. Her lips would still be full, and especially that bottom lip would still stick out and excite me. Her tiny button-shaped nose still twitched slightly when she was angry, and those big innocent blue eyes still sparkled and caught every stray ray of light. Then, suddenly, I realized that in twenty years, when she would be in her late forties, approaching fifty, I would be in my sixties, approaching seventy, and probably close to infirmity and death. She would also use those plump, seductive lips and eyes to excite some woman she had settled down with, and I doubt she would even remember me by then. That thought alone was sobering enough to make me stop staring at her and decide to go to bed. I checked my email and went to bed. In fact, it was still early, barely eleven o'clock in the evening. As I drifted off to sleep, I couldn't deny that my thoughts were still not on Jill. I decided that I just needed to go out and do things more regularly so that I could start dating women who were more available and suitable for me. I drifted in and out of sleep for I don't know how long before I realized I wasn't alone. Jill tried to act out a scene for me until I realized that she was sober and she had to confess everything. Maybe you love me too much, she said. I told Melanie that you would never do this. Okay, you're still drunk, I said. Now you're talking about Melanie, not Natalie. You and her will never... Nothing like this has ever happened. Mel is not interested in women, she said. She was never even curious. And speaking of never, I have never been drunk. I did put some alcohol on my lips so you could smell it and maybe even taste it, but... Mason? I don't drink. Then why were you at the bar? I asked. I was confused. Because Mo is my uncle, and I was completely safe there. Besides, I needed a place where you could come and save me, she said. Why did I need to save you? I asked. Why couldn't you just call me and talk? Because Melanie and I talked yesterday before she sent you home. This was her whole plan. We have a very big problem that needs to be taken care of, and she saw this as a possible solution, she said. What's the problem? I asked. Recently you discovered that you like a certain girl. You're sure she thinks you're too old for her, and you are also sure that you are not her type. You're also not a strong-willed type of person, so instead of acting on your feelings or exploring them, you overthink everything and just run away to hide from the situation. On the other hand, I have another problem. There's a guy I fell in love with when I was a kid. I never thought it would be even remotely possible for me to get my hands on him, but suddenly he's available and I want him. I want him so bad I can taste him, but I don't know a damn thing about the boy-girl game. 
Hmm, I said. Well, I've never had a relationship with a man, period. And I've never done this, you know, with a guy. I just looked at her in shock. I'm not entirely innocent. I just didn't have a real man. And whether you know it or not, I was ready for this. Maybe I should say that I was ready for you to come. But don't you... Um... Well, do you know? I started. Mason, you can say it. We should be able to talk about different things. I actually don't know who I am. I really don't think anyone knows. Most people I know just think of themselves as people. And as humans, there are certain things that we find attractive. I know a lot of guys who always only look at my breasts. They only date women with large breasts. This is what turns them on. This is their personal preference. I know some guys who are not turned on by women at all. They only like guys. This is their personal preference. For some reason, my mouth fascinates you, doesn't it? Obviously, Natalie just likes sex. She claimed to love me for years, but she just didn't seem to understand how much it hurts when the person who claims to love you needs someone else to satisfy them. It makes you feel... less than... she said. Well, what about you? I asked. What do you prefer? I prefer... she began. I long to know that the person I am with loves me. I don't really care if it's a woman, a man, a three-toed sloth, or a mustang. I just feel it here. She pointed to her chest. If the person who is special to me feels the same way. Mason, you were in mourning for a very long time. Mama Melanie will always be special to all of us. I will never take her place in your heart. But I think you've already given me a place in your heart. As for me, I ended up with Natalie only because you were unavailable. Even if I met you when we were together, if she had not cheated on me, I would never have left her. You and I are one and the same. This is new for both of us. I know what I want. I want us to be together. And I want this with all my heart. You don't have to make a commitment to me now, but I think we owe it to ourselves to at least try. If it doesn't work, we'll just go back to being miserable. So, where are we? We've come to the point where I'm telling you that I really love you, I said. I already know that, Mason, she said. I heard the happiness in her voice. But could you show me? We slept the rest of the night cuddled together. We woke up, made love again, and went back to sleep, still entwined in each other's arms. The next thing I remember was that the sun was shining through the windows, and we slept through half the next day. I really think the only reason we woke up then was because the phone rang. Jill released one arm from my embrace and threw the phone off the machine, then rummaged around the nightstand until she found it. Good morning, she said. Her voice was still husky from sleep, but the tone was truly cheerful. This was a good sign. I didn't want her to regret what we did. Yes, it is. And I did it. Of course it is. Do you want to talk to him? Okay. That sounds like a plan. This gives us a week to get dressed and get out of bed. Bye, she said cheerfully. Then she looked at me. I think you broke me, she said. That bottom lip stuck out and my heart melted. Jill, do you mind? I began. No, it's not like that, she said. I'm not fucking fine. I'm like frosted sugar flakes. I'm great. I just looked at her and smiled. I just didn't want you to regret anything, I said. This was the start of something wonderful. We spent a lot of time together. We had barbecues with our families and took trips together. Our life was what I thought was ideal. But I have to admit that I had my doubts. Firstly, there was an age difference. Nineteen years separate us. But deep down, I think what bothered me the most was that she spent most of her life in love with a woman. What if I was just a phase she was going through? I think I'm the only guy on the planet who comes home every day terrified of the smell of an unfamiliar perfume. When we were in public, she did not take her eyes off me. She didn't pay any attention to other men or women. Jill never gave me any reason to doubt her, but I was still worried. We did face a few challenges, but we got through them together. One of them was just before her divorce was finalized. Natalie asked for changes to their settlement agreement. I think she heard about the money Jill got and wanted some of it. The judge studied our case and found out what really happened. 
he saw that Nat was actually the reason for the divorce, and that at the time of the actual divorce, neither girl had any money. All the money Jill got came after they got divorced, so Nat, there was nothing to really on. I think this brought Natalie back into Jill's mind. She mentioned it to me a couple of times, and I suppose it was inevitable. The only problem for me was that it happened too quickly. One afternoon I came home early and smelled a strange perfume smell in my house. I heard voices speaking in low tones. I looked out onto our veranda from the kitchen where no one could see me. Don't you miss me, Jill? Don't you miss the way things used to be? We were the perfect couple, Natalie said. And now it would be even better for us. You have enough money that we won't have to work for a while. We could travel, just the two of us. The boys are finished, now and forever. There's really only one good thing men can do for you. But after they fix your car, they'll still want to be around. Natalie laughed at her own joke. But I didn't hear Jill join in. How much time do we have before Mason returns home? Natalie asked. I'm kind of excited. That's the first thing you've said so far that I agree with, Jill said. That's right, said Natalie. Jill began to smile. What if Mason returns home? Natalie asked. Maybe we could do this together. Don't even think about it, damn it, Jill suddenly snapped. Mason is not like that. He doesn't need two women and he doesn't have that fantasy. I am more than enough for him. And she fell silent. Mason, is that you, honey? I said nothing. I thought I heard him come in, she said. Anyway, let's get back to what we were talking about. So, you said something about being horny, Natalie said. Maybe we could do something really quick. That won't help, Jill snapped. Well, this could be a start, Natalie said. I know you miss me, so why don't we just run away together? Because you stupid, when I said I was excited, I didn't mean you. I was talking about Mason. When I think about all the time I wasted on you, I just feel stupid. Mason loves me, and I love him. I would never risk this for anything or anyone, especially you, Jill said. But you called me, Natalie snapped. Yes, I did it, Jill smiled. I always try to keep my word, and part of our divorce agreement was that I would talk to you after the divorce was final. We talked. We're done. See you. I need to move on to the next stage of my life without anything from the old days hanging over me. But how can you treat me like this? I... I love you, Natalie moaned. Jill walked away from the table and entered the kitchen, looking around. She looked straight at me and smiled. Her smile lit up the room. Natalie came in right after her. Hello, honey, she said. I leaned over and kissed her. I'll go upstairs so you girls can talk, I said. Hello, Nat. Any hard feelings about the divorce? Um, no, she said. It's a pity that you weren't my lawyer. You destroyed Gunner. Last I heard, he was getting gas in Kentucky. Sorry, I'm overly protective of the people I love, I said. But you will find someone else. Even with all those damn tattoos, you're a beautiful girl. I looked at Jill and smiled. You are both beautiful girls. Save that for the trial, Jill said. Who are we going to court now? I asked. I'm suing you. Jill said. I looked at her strangely. For what? I asked. I knew there was a joke coming, but it was serious. Let's see, she said. You ruined my reputation. You used me for your own sexual gratification to start. How did I ruin your reputation? I asked. And you also received some satisfaction. She walked over while Natalie watched me. Yes, I did it, she smiled. But in about seven or eight weeks... When my belly is swollen and everyone knows I'm pregnant and single, what will people think of me? She asked, sticking out her lower lip. You are pregnant? I asked in shock. How are you? Um, I think you did it, she said. Natalie and I were together for a long time, and then this never happened. So I never took pills or anything like that. What did you expect when you did this to me around the clock, day and night? Natalie's jaw dropped and she just stood there, watching as Jill jumped into my arms. Can we settle this out of court? I asked. We could work this out in bed, Jill said. 
I was thinking more about renting a jewelry store and a church, I said. Maybe tomorrow, she said. But tonight I'm holding an audition for my future husband. And where are these auditions held? I asked. Upstairs, second door on the right, she said, smiling as we began to climb the stairs. This is our bedroom, isn't it? I asked. Yes, I think so, she said, grabbing my hand. Isn't that where it all started? I asked. Yes, she said. Natalie, come out yourself. Don't steal anything. It was nice meeting you. Do I even need to say that we lived happily ever after? Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.